Hello and welcome to the Poor Hammer Podcast, episode 110. I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? In today's episode is not a happy-go-lucky good times episode. I mean, there's some good parts of it if you constructive criticism sprinkled in with a bunch of hate. <laughs> The planned snark in the title should give it away. This is a Brad Unleashed episode. This is not a let's try to stay positive episode. I do want to keep this all positive. If you are the type of person who doesn't really like when I go on a negative rant, just hit the like button and leave. (laughs) (laughs) It's probably best for you to skip this episode. I think next week we'll do something a bit more upbeat. I try not to do a bunch of negative episodes in a row. We try to have a lot of fun around episodes like this one because I know it can bring the room down. I don't want to do that all the time. I also don't want to be always a downer kind of like it's fun to talk fun things about the hobby that we do. So this is going to be a negative one though. But this is, yes, going to have to be a negative one. We're going to do a deep dive into how to make a codex that doesn't suck. (laughs) So without any further ado, let's get into into this sounds good all right brad we've got how to make a codex and then the uh very important qualifier afterwards of that doesn't suck it's easy to just make a codex the qualifier of that it doesn't suck is where the tricky part comes in you know that's the devil in the details as it were and we are now seven codices and one supplement into the edition we're essentially a fourth to a third the way through thereabouts so we have more than just you know the initial batch of 10th edition we've seen okay this is how codexes are for 10th edition this is the expectation going forward of what codexes are going to look like for all the rest of 10th and if they don't a solid percentage of your player base is stuck with these either way That's true. So while I can come up with improvements and talk about which ones of these are actually good, I don't hate all of these, by the way. Spoilers, Orcs is amazing. I'm thrilled. I'm pretty happy so far. So and like there's good parts of a bunch of them as well, even the ones that I don't think that you're going to have great feelings on. There's some glimmers of, of greatness. All of them do some things right. Some of them do almost everything right. Some of them do very few things right. So, yeah, I mean, you could list out like here's all the improvements, but like they're not going to be able to make those because the codex is released. And before we get further, I want to do a couple things. First of all, I want to say this is not about competitive making something busted. It's easy to jack up numbers and make everything good. That's stupid. That's not why we're here. We can also make anything competitive without the codex and just do the balance data slate stuff. Like we can just make a unit cost efficient to a point that it doesn't matter what the rest of the rules are for the army. It's just the best thing like flamers. So we're going to avoid that discussion. This is about design philosophy philosophies within a faction. Also, we want to break down what makes up a codex. So there's a very hefty first like 40 to 100 pages that are paperweights made out of paper. So I guess weight paper. Very high quality paper. Eh, decently quality paper. Those are parts of an art book that are unfortunately stuck to the rule book I'm forced to buy. That is the problem of it's two very distinct sections essentially of here's some cool art, here's rules. And then we've got an army rule, which is a single page. Then we have our detachments for our customer to choose between to play their sub-faction of choice. Right. Some amount of from one to uh, eight. A number. (laughs) We'll get into that. It's one of the key problems. (laughs) Some amount of detachments, yes. And then the crusade rules, which to be honest, just make them fun. I'm not really going to give a lesson on crusade rules. There are misses in crusade. We talked about them on older crusade episode for last edition. You can make bad crusade rules, but by and large, just make me read it and go, damn, I can't wait to play this. It's the fun narrative. Make it fun. Don't worry quite as much about any balance or, you know, anything like that. The only key one that was a miss on a couple last time, make sure that playing crusade with your faction is an upgrade don't remove a bunch of stuff and then piecemeal a little bit back and forth to them don't make it where it's ninth edition blood angels where the further in the crusade you get the worse you are for some reason 
Yeah. And then our final section of this codex is just the data sheets that were already freely available online, but with updates to them so that you can invalidate those and make sure that the free rules go away. Right. I'm not really <laughs> going to focus on the data sheet part, but it is a very scummy part in that it also is sold on the side next to the codex as a bunch of flashcards for $35. I honestly like the flashcards. I don't hate them, but it's an extra $35. The problem is is that like it should be here's your rule booklet and then here's your pamp you know your booklet of cards and that's the $35 and then if you want like the codex it'll be like the art book essentially but that's whatever selling the cards in this as the codex part especially because they're updated online and they have a separate product that sold the flashcards it's just padding the codex to make it look bigger right like it's just adding pages to the codex to make it look fancier so that you're not as annoyed by it for the price we could get into the whole the entire rules section is padding and should be just delivered digitally for free as we've said so that the game can be played using the free rules and the paid for models and then you can sell us an art book and then those first 40 to 100 pages of paperweight I just joked about are the point of the book and it's a very different evaluation that is much more positive to be honest. And that's the thing is like if you did that I think you could still sell the flashcards. They're cool. It's kind of annoying that like you know they're not going to be perfectly up to date but that's okay. It's a physical item that's fine. It's better to have the fixes online but that's kind of neat. So I wouldn't want to see that go away but as it is right now this is the layout of the codex. We sell rules and if we're selling rules we have to be better at rules than League of Legends, Dota 2, Magic the Gathering, a whole bunch of games where the rules are free. I mean, let's be honest, Warhammer's never going to be better rules than Magic the Gathering. No. <laughs> Look at the improvements Flesh and Blood made by hiring a proper Magic the Gathering designer and letting him go to town fixing up Flesh and Blood. That's true, yeah. Games Workshop could be upgraded on the rules side of things, but that's not the key point of this. This is an instruction manual for current GW designers. So, moving into this, let's get to the army rule first. I'm going to save most of our rules discussion that are universal for the detachment section where most of my rants come into play. The army rule section just to lay it out there. If your army rule doesn't cover something for your whole army, try again. I can't believe I had to write this rule and put it as the first rule. I can't believe you failed with it in both an index and then the codex immediately after with AdMech. Yeah. If your army rule doesn't cover the whole army, try again. I guess that there could be like mild caveats of like the army rule covers everything other than fortifications. Or everything other than a unit that famously is a mercenary unit. Yeah, very specific outliers, but good lord, please. It's the army rule. It should affect the army, the whole army, everybody in the army. The army rule should also be something that is easy to keep in mind at all times. It should have a regular effect on the game that is memorable, something so that it is a second nature to a player after a game or two. Basically, don't be Chaos Knights where it's forgettable and you have to keep looking up what it's doing. <laughs> Chaos Knights is definitely an annoying one. It breaks a lot of rules, but most of them we'll get to later. The key one for this aspect is one that we've complained about on our Magic podcast for designs of certain cards. This is something you can think of for many games you play. When you have an awkward extra rule that doesn't happen often, but could actually have an impact on the outcome of the game, and you forget about it, and then 20 minutes later go, oh shit, we forgot about it. It's just such a bad feeling. It is miserable in gameplay. You do not want your players to have that happen. It's one thing to be like, oh, I forgot to use the stratagem that would have been. It was still available and just because you forgot meant that like you chose not to do it. It's another thing entirely when it's the base rule of my army is forgettable. Yeah, it's something that like it should be happening. It just didn't because we all forgot about it because it only matters one in six games. That's enough to be that feeling of God Damn, everything should have been different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if it would have been different, but I'll be stuck thinking about it. Yeah, Chaos Knights is definitely an irritating one. Something clean and simple. Honestly, Space Marines isn't terrible. It's pretty simple. It's like choose a unit and reroll hits against it kind of thing. Yeah, I think most of the army rules are fine. There's a few of them that I think are misses, but it tends not to be where things go wrong. Where things go wrong is in the next section. Right, the Crusade. Right. 
No. <laughs> ah, sorry. The, I forgot about the 10 pages between the army rule and the crusade. 10, you say? <laughs> what a large codex you have. Yeah. So, for the detachment rules, first, I'm going to lecture you on what the bare minimum standard is that you need to hold yourself to. This is slightly hyperbolic, but your detachments is the codex. Especially since we've had the major changes in 10th with, like, rules culling, and they also gave us the indexes. So, like, the detachments are the codex now. So a bit of a rant here. If you have less than six detachments, you need to get back to work. <laughs> The Custodes Codex is nine pages long if we don't include the data sheets with updates. Wow. The Codex is nine pages long. Tau is the same. Tyranids didn't even get a Kronos Shooty Detachment equivalent, which is something they already had. They just forgot to put it in there. Six is, again, a minimum, not a maximum. You did go over that minimum with Space Marines. It is said that you'll be going over it again with Chaos Space Marines. Good. Yeah, as much as we can joke about Space Marines getting the beneficial treatment, that's good. Everybody else needs to still get more, though. <laughs> you can't argue that you didn't think of anything else to add, either. Just the Kronos shooting detachment. You had it. You took it away. And this edition is going to end with Space Marines having access to over 20 detachments at this rate. <laughs> this is just counting the current and future Space Marine supplements being the same size. Yeah, that's not bad. You can do better than four detachments. I mean, like, 20 detachments. There is a certain point where you've gone a bit too far and, like, a bunch of them probably should just be crusade ruled kind of thing. Space Marines is always going to be a special problem. It's fine. We can ignore it, but it's there to show that you can't say you ran out of ideas. Yeah, 10 should be more than doable for basically everybody. And six is easily doable for everybody. I have six types of detachments you could give everyone before we get into each of the actual types having multiple examples. There's core fundamental styles of gameplay in Warhammer. Hit a detachment on all of those. To put this in perspective, I did a word count on this show notes. There are almost as many words in the show notes for this episode that you are listening to right now than there are new rules words in the Custodes Codex. That's actually pretty bad given our show notes are <laughs> anemic. <laughs> <laughs> I write these up after coming home from my day job for my hobby. You can't say you ran out of time to get these in here. This is not an acceptable line to be falling below. I need you to understand how basic this is. And this is assuming a single person is in charge of each codex, which I want to not believe, although... <laughs> Hopefully it's not a single person in charge of multiple. But Games Workshop is currently pulling down over half a billion dollars of revenue a year. It's not a mom and pop shop, but it seems to be run like one. Yeah, it's the 80s, 90s nerd culture hobby company that became successful. So Right, but the point is, with half a billion a year, you can afford to put some effort into every release you have. Especially since you're charging $60 for this. Yeah. If we're counting these nine pages, and I use this Tau Codex example that I just used while I was doing this math. I picked a random page with a detachment rule on it. Did a word count on it. Might have been wrong, but I came up with 249 non-flavor text words on the page. I mean, flavor text kinda matters. But not for the rules, which is the only thing this is being sold for, because it is a rule book. Yeah. This is not a flavor book. If it was a flavor book, I would be buying it voluntarily. You're buying it for the art and the flavor. I see what you're saying. We're buying this as a rule book. And as a rule book, we are paying for 249 words on this page, nine pages long, 60 US dollars. You're <laughs> charging 2.5 cents per word. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to break it down into per word. Because it's multiple pennies for every word of rules they've written per person on the planet who plays this game. <laughs> per army they play. Yeah, and it's not really acceptable. 10th edition is too small and simple for it to not be free. Rules wise, model wise, no problem. And like, to be fair, like each page that gets added to a book costs some amount of money. Man. Man, if only the internet existed and we could do these digitally and not have to pay for all of the paper and the Chinese printing press we're using and everything else. Yes, but even if we're still keeping it the way it is, 
is. An extra page is not that much more money compared to the fact that you're committing to printing the book at the start. Like the most cost is going to be, I want to print a book. Especially a hardcover book, which the codices are. But it's one of those like an extra 10 pages. It's not nothing, but in the scheme of a hardcover book. And we're aware there will be manufacturing breakpoints where you can't go over a certain book length before it has to use a different pressing. I am sure there are always limits and stuff and complexities within. The point stands on a general level. From a monetary standpoint, there is no acceptable reason to be charging this much money for this amount of rules, essentially. Especially because, like, they aren't as bulletproof, as in-depth as, like, Magic the Gathering. Or the entirety of the video game industry, of which no one is selling their rules. Exactly. (laughs) The rest of the industry out there, they've moved past this. So with the rant out of the way, let's actually break down detachments, talk about them. A large amount of my complaint comes from the lack thereof and detachment rules themselves. We will touch on enhancements and strats, but those to me are the secondary thing once you've decided the flavor of the detachment, what the rule will be, which models it will affect, and then you go through the motions from there. Yeah, I mean, I've kind of thought like detachments are more than just the army rule that they're putting together but that army rule is like the entire foundation that the strats actually are based on and can show off and then like the enhancements are just like the finishing cherry on top you know the details so like the army rule has to be foundational if it's not then it doesn't matter what the strats and the enhancements are doing it's just gonna crumble and let's talk about the types of detachments we can look into making when we're designing this new codex yeah you've got your unit Universal faction fluff theme detachment. This is basically what the index detachments covered for the most part. So the kind of like, hey, you can play anything and this will be okay. And the main fantasy of the faction, even if it doesn't cover everything. So like with orcs, the index did not cover shooty daka orcs, but it was the main fantasy of orcs covered. Yeah, it was melee, get stuck in. Yeah, it's the immediate thought of what's an orc? Oh, it's a guy with a chopper running at you. All right covered. (laughs) <laughs> so that's number one. It's our primary fluff, the original generic. This is the faction at its most generalist. Hits the expectations. Number two, combined arms. This is one for multi-pronged armies. Custodes has a actual very good example. Talons of the Emperor, when that hits shelves, is going to be their combined arms attachment, where you want a balance of sisters and custodies, and you get good payoff for it. Well done. Drukari has the one-piece ship. Not well done. I, that's a whole kind of separate thing. Thing. But it's an execution thing when we get into later rules. Yeah. Well, right now, we're talking about, like, here's the basic types of detachments that you should have. Then you've got your major themes. This is, to give you an example, it would be like in Drukari, having one for witches, one for Cabalites, and having one for homunculi covens. That's three for Drukari just in the major theme section. We're up to five without <laughs> thinking for a moment and getting into the second half of these. For Space Marines, this is covering all of your major special snowflakes. This is how you make space marines for the most part. These should be like, the universal faction theme is the, you know, shooting from the hip, what kind of fluff does the army follow, and then the major themes are all of the rest of the major ideas that you would come up with, that like, if you did a family feud and pulled a hundred random people and asked them what the faction theme should be, these would be the rest of them. (laughs) For Tyranians, a psychic theme. Shooting. A monster theme. A little gremlins running at you at full speed theme. You've got all of your major themes go here. It's very easy for most factions, especially ones with varied ranges. Yes, it's going to be more difficult for the smaller ranges that are, you know, specific into a an idea, like, like world eaters. All right, you've got kind of a one note. Yeah, anyone who is a single unified theme with a small range is going to have issues issues with many major theme detachments. But then we get into the minor slash specific themes. These are going to be ones that focus on... Tyranids has a good example with the Harvester one. It is not Mm. my favorite detachment. It does have issues with rules we'll get to later, but it is a minor theme in the army that got a detachment. Yeah. To use a new one, or Champions leaked today slash yesterday, depending, I don't remember. And this one is Custodes making their characters better, which is, it's a clever minor theme. Like, Custodes is a tighter range 
range. There's not going to be that many major themes that need factions. And it's kind of cool to show off like here's the elitist elite army and the characters are supposed to be even cooler. So this would be another type of faction where it would work well on a faction where people tend to love the character models and want to be abuse them. Thousand Sons would be fine with this. <laughs> I'm just using an example I can think of off the top of my head. I'm appearing on YouTube as a thousand sun right now, but the point stands. <laughs> the point does stand, yes. So this is where we put those nice, tighter themes that only cover a small fraction of the army or a singular angle of the army. Now we've got the easiest out. This is the most Melvin of themes to go that route. This is your attribute theme. This is your classic, I don't give a shit about the lore. I just want to buff attacks. I want a sub-faction that makes me faster. I want a sub-faction that plays with Battleshock. Don't make that half the codex. It can be one faction. And that's the thing when it comes to some of these, like the minor and this attribute one. That's great. They're great at uh, types of detachments as the, you know, eighth ninth after we've done the universal the major themes hit those and then we can go on to these smaller ones i would say attribute is not a small one attribute is a large one that's a cop out because lore isn't really strong in that faction it's more the coverage for smaller factions that's fair i hadn't thought about it but now that you bring it up these attribute themes can actually be the start of a new minor theme evolving kind of thing yes. like if you keep playing with it it'll become a minor theme People will enjoy it. They have existed throughout 40k's history. It's how a lot of sub-factions have spawned of, hey, I want an advanced and charge sub-faction. Can one of you lore nerds write me up <laughs> lore for a new hive fleet or something and I'll throw it in here. That's how those tend to happen when you reveal behind the curtain. That's just how you fill out a faction as you're developing it. So attribute themes are fine, especially on smaller rangers. It's how we build up identity for a faction so that it's more fleshed out and you feel like there's major themes. And then we've got the last one, the scummy. It's the scummy one. This is the one that is probably going to be pushed on you by someone in your sales team going, hey, do me a favor in this codex. We really need to bump the numbers up because we made a bad investment on that new monolith. It's not selling. <laughs> Get me a detachment entirely built around selling that hunk of junk. I love the monolith model. Eric is the monolith hater. I'm just being a salesman in this. <laughs> No, you're totally right, though. And I feel like GW's been pretty good about not over-inundating that section. This section is allowed after you've filled out all your major themes, your combined arms, your generalist. When everything else is filled out, you can make the model seller if you want that seventh faction. Or the sixth, even, if you have a really rough to fill out army. But I believe in you. You can get higher than six. It's a low bar. It is a pretty low bar. I feel like there is, like six pretty easy for every army and then you know then you can have a couple of these like the model seller one which is like yeah it's not gonna be the greatest design because it's so focused around this new thing or whatever model it's gonna be and that's fine people are gonna enjoy it you're gonna be able to play it at least once if you have that model and you're gonna be like that was fun it's also good if it is a beloved model that doesn't quite fit in anything the monolith is a good example. Admex robots who are kind of stuck on their own. <laughs> The Admech range is a bunch of Skatari and like the one robots. Here's the random robot that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you can make these sub-factions. It's fine. They're not always negative, even though we are being scummy salesmen telling you how to put them in there. Yeah, I think that goes over like the primary types of detachments. So let's get into our rules for filling them out. You have to hit this checklist, <laughs> double check it, go through it again before you ship it off to print. Any codex that can't hit these requirements has failed. Does not pass inspection straight to jail. Number one, you must have a detachment for every major angle of an army. Drukari has the three major sections. If I don't see a cabal, a witch, and a coven section, back to the drawing board. If you don't at least have an infantry heavy guard and a tank heavy guard, stop. What are you doing? And that's the thing is like every codex has, here's the major angles. Guard has tanks and infantry. Tyranids, one that's already been done. You've got monsters. You've got the swarm of little dudes. You've got squidwards. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>
<laughs> there are different angles of the army that are very clear major themes in the model line. Make sure that a more casual person who is into an aspect of an army aesthetically can open this codex and go, this one, this is mine. This is my detachment. <laughs> this hole was made for me. This hole was made for me. Uh, and that is important because these are the major angles to the army. Like these are why people are there essentially. Like that's why so many people have decided to play certain factions is because they enjoy the guard tanks. Well, you need to be able to play the guard tanks then. The next one, and it's one where I think there's some argument, but I'm going to make this the rule. Your detachment rule must have an effect for at least two controllable turns of the game. If it's not controllable, it needs to be at least three. And there's a secondary rule to this later. Uh, yeah, I was like, there's another part of it, but I agree. The detachment rule needs to affect the game. There can be exceptions. There are certain things like if you wanted to make a certain turn for a, an attack and charge detachment that just buffs things like crazy. You know, we're talking like wah levels of let's go. Maybe, but you better be very careful in doing that. And you had better be very certain that you have reasons to have done that. The game is more than one or two turns. The once per game rules have to be very rare and they better be the flashiest thing to make up for it. You should be questioning why you're writing this over one that has a more long-term effect on the game. Yeah, very much. If there's any limited rounds that like it's actually going to be in effect, it needs to be strong and it needs to do things. I feel like the Tyranid Synaptic Nexus... Choose between the buffs and you get to use one on each turn. Yeah, it's a way of doing it. It's a great one. That one and Gladius Detachment, perfect. They affect three turns of the game at your pleasure. Is it at your pleasure or at your leisure? I mean, you could pleasure yourself. They affect three turns of the game as you please. Yourself. Uh, <clears throat> I know all of that is staying in. <laughs> Yes, but optimally, the default should be make it game long. Just be like world eaters and you now have this during the game. Enjoy. <laughs> That should be the default. My next one, it's a little vague, but you know it when you see it. Every detachment should make you want to play it, even if it's bad. I immediately was like, yeah, I know the Admech Rad Zone is bad. Red Bombardment was terrible, but like I said, when it was revealed as an index. It's unique and tickles a little part in the back of my brain going, yeah, but like, that's cool, right? <laughs> It should make you say at least, man, that'll be funny once. You need at least that level. And, you know, it's it's easy to have the, oh, this detachment is just good. Like, it just does a lot of the things that I want to do well. Then, yeah, it's probably going to make people want to play it. But there are ones like Red Zone that, like, it's not good. But there's still going to be, like, some fun to playing it. And that is okay to have a detachment that's like that. The fact that it was an index thing is a whole fucking other problem. But we're talking codexes it's fine to have that as your seventh up next in this one is for the custodies players out there who may be very salty right now yeah you got a couple things taken away from you a detachment rule can never solve the army's problem it's going to lead to an impossible to fix internal imbalance luckily this was solved for the custodies release for all the problems that codex has there is no longer the universal band-aid index attachment that is the only weakness this army has is mortal wounds what if i make one of the detachments make you basically immune to mortal wounds genius yeah that means that like if you're playing why would you not choose it it's your weakness and it solves it it's like if guard had one for infantry guard that is you can never remove more than three models from a unit in a turn right like <laughs> it's it's ridiculous i'm weak to a bunch of anti-late infantry fire oh well this detachment solves that problem shit i guess that's just what you do and it's tough because like having a detachment that's solves your weaknesses that cleanly is cool and nice but it just makes it so much of a crutch that like it ruins all the rest of the design space and the entire codex will then have to be balanced around it being assumed your points is going to assume that you are immune to your weakness now and everything else will feel impossibly bad yeah changing ad max ballistic skill kind of thing of like we based everything around this well what if i didn't want to do that specific thing it's not quite quite the same, but you can see how a detachment rule shouldn't be so ubiquitous kind of thing. It's also why I don't like that with Death Guard solution, instead of fixing the army 
rule, they added more to the detachment rule. I very much hope that is solved when the codex comes out. You don't want most of your power coming from a detachment because then they all have to be that good or you're playing one detachment. Yeah. Or your army is going to be balanced off that one detachment and everything else will feel awful. Yeah, I mean that just leads to skew lists as the default essentially. All right, the next one is one of my shots against the Tyranid Codex. If a detachment can't cover at least half the points of a 2,000 point game in like a balanced thematic looking list you've put together for your detachment's fantasy list, then you need to look at expanding the pool of buffable units. Or more models. I mean, that is a solution. Sure. That's not going to be something the Codex writer can solve, though. No. You're probably working in the confines of what has already been designed. You could put in requests for next edition to get some holes filled, but my example here is going to be the Harvesters. There's a grand total of four. If you max out the legal limit of all of them, which includes buying nine pyrovores, rip your wallet, it only gets up to 1245 points. If you're looking at, like, a pair of Hyrospecs, a pair of Psychophages, four pyrovores, still quite a bit, and six Ripper Swarms, you're still at 760 points only. Yeah, and that's, like, that's a Harvester list in my mind. Harvester did have the okay thing of the detachment has a lot of play between Harvesters helping things around them without caring about the keyword, but then other parts of it clearly care about only Harvester and this gets into the whole like really should have added a fifth or sixth in here including a character. Yeah there are some ways to expand like you said the the buffable units to have a little bit more to it of like here is something that happens to the general Tyranid models or whatever but if you're a Harvester this is what you get kind of thing where it's like okay this is clearly for a smaller part of the army but like I'll still get stuff from the rest of it. Or you go and add another keyword in to it or broaden the keyword and retrofit your solution lore wise. For instance, the Venethrope and Toxicrine don't have any subfaction that cares about either of them. They're kind of like two models that are part of the gross Squidward face family that just don't belong anywhere. They probably could have gotten thrown in with Harvesters. You just backfill a reason why they're part of the Harvester family. Ta-da! The Norn Assimilator, new model, says the word assimilation doesn't do a anything with harvesting i think it's one of those that like that can also a bit move into the attribute theme model seller kind of thing of like we can use that as a way of expanding the lore and expanding so that you know the next codex has that fundamentally built up it has been seeded yeah and like if it doesn't work it'll be like oh huh that doesn't work. We have to do something different. But if people enjoyed that, we can actually continue it and flesh it out further and that kind of stuff. So really, you can't have a detachment, though, that doesn't cover half your list. Like, at that point, you're not really playing the detachment. <laughs> the next one is a more minor point, but it's one that even gets issues with some army rules. If an ability is defensive in nature, make it so it triggers at start of battle round, not start of your turn. Going second should not dumpster your ability to have your defensive rule on turn one. In competitive play, when we're playing competitively, hiding our models on turn one right, it's not that big of a deal. We can play around it. But that's the thing. If you're playing optimally kind of thing, you're playing around this negative and like it doesn't matter. If you're a casual player, the average person playing this game, then like you don't have the focus to play around it perfectly. And then it comes up and it's a negative and it's like, but why didn't it just make it easy? It's also just a logistics thing that I don't like there's no reason to not just have it battle round you don't need to keep this qualifier of like oh I wanted to use it on turn two but only my turn two because I was going second so yeah it's just poor design in my opinion for no real benefit but I feel like the next one kind of rolls into this and is more important so this is probably the key one to take home here I know we kind of proved it through the index of the edition and it was <laughs> proved last edition already yet we still needed to remind you again in 10th if you do not have your rule on turn two, you do not have your rule. Turn one, I can accept that there can be army rules that don't affect turn one. It's not great. You need to have a reason, but it's possible. But late game, I'm fine with because it's just not very important if we're being honest. 40k is set up as a three turn game disguised as a five turn game. Yeah, the impact of the rule on turn five is just so much less because you have so many less resources. Turn two is the core of the game. That's when everybody's kind of 
have moved into their positions, all of the strategy of you and your opponent have kind of been playing out, and now everything is like, okay, go. Do the things. Optimally, you would want your detachment rule to be active when you're doing the things. And turn two is probably the biggest turn of the game. Turn one can be, but turn two is almost always a huge slugfest. When it's not, it tends to be because someone's army roll won't turn on until later and they're playing Ultra Turtle to get around it. Yeah. Which is not a great feeling. For either player, honestly. Ask Blood Angel players how they felt about it all through night, having to play super defensively with their offensive army that didn't activate till turn three. Yeah, it's not fun because you're like, well, we could have just skipped ahead. <laughs> Why are we wasting this time kind of thing? Obviously, the example we're giving here is Kayun, Patient Hunter for Tau, their index attachment slash it's also in the codex. Also with army rules, back to Chaos Knights, Doom and Darkness doesn't even turn on until battle round three and then it's forgettable. Woohoo, plus one to wound against battle shocked units with my strength 12 cannon. <laughs> Got him. What a great ability. <laughs> Yeah, if the first words are from the third battle round onwards, go back to the drawing board. All right, and now, in a similar vein, if your rule covers less than half the board, it better be cracked, or it shouldn't have been written. If it covers less than that, and is like a static location or zone, you need to double that bonus that I just said, because now it's your opponent is just able to play around it, and your rule is just going to be off for the vast majority of the time. So it better be epic. And at this point, you really need to be giving me a good reason to keep this instead of just a better universal rule that you don't have to worry about this crap for. There is some interesting ideas that like, as the extra bonus detachment, I made this aura-based thing around your opponent's deployment zone. <coughs> Demons. <coughs> Admech. <coughs> Uh, but like similarly to how turn two has like the most impact because it has the most resources deployed, most of your resources are not going to be deployed in half of the map kind of thing. Like if that's the case and it's that bad for your opponent, they're just going to deploy around it. <laughs> and I'm saying half here. Demons and Admech have ones that care about literally a third. Or we could be doing like the uh, Explorator Maniple or whatever in Admech, the acquisition one where you target a single objective objective marker yeah. one objective marker is your army rule a single one which like there is a way to make it so fucking busted that it doesn't matter but that's not really going to be that fun and at the same time the fact that like the other detachments in your faction are going to be based around the rule being active for your army so that means that like any of these that have more restrictions either being it on you know how many points you have available in models or locations on the board means that like that balance for the rest of the detachments and the rest of the actual sheets of um, the models are just going to be so difficult to make right that, man, it's almost certainly not going to work. Next up, when making a rule for a detachment, make sure your rule matches the fantasy you envision for the detachment. Come up with a list. Look at the list physically. You're at Games Workshop. I'm sure you have beautifully painted models that you can put out on a table and go, this is how I want this sub-faction to look. This list will be good in this sub-faction. This is very much an expectation of the players, and you have to succeed in meeting those expectations. The one that comes to mind is Crusher Stampede. The Tyranid monster detachment that is like a self-wounding detachment that does not work well with the most key monster unit Tyranids has to offer, which is the Carnifex. Everyone loves the Carnifex. It's part of 40k's vernacular with a distraction Carnifex. I mean, it's a very likely reason on why you like Tyranid monster so much. Even from a stat line standpoint, it is essentially the Dreadnought of Tyranids. The Dreadnought is probably the most beloved thing in Space Marines. The Carnifex should work well in a detachment that is targeting Tyranid monsters. Crusher Stampede can basically never activate a Carnifex. It's just set up perfectly wrong for it. In addition to just not matching the fantasy of big monster mash well with being a if you're wounded thing, that should be like a vampiric look, a zombifying thing. The sisters with their self-sacrifice theme is perfect for an under half strength thing. Like, okay, there I can make it work. The rule itself, it 
fails to meet every expectation of, I just want to play big monsters. The person wanting to play big monsters wants to do a couple things. Probably charge them in easier and probably make their big stuff even bigger. That is exactly what you want to do. Because humans are simple. We're real easy to please. If you give me a tiered and monsters get plus one strength, plus two on the turn they charge or something, I'm probably happy. It's a damn low bar. I thought of that in two seconds and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm going to play some stupid ass monsters. You know what's cooler than a dinosaur? A bigger dinosaur. What if we even give them an attack so they hit more? And we're just blood angels at this point, but you get the point. Yeah, the expectations, the most basic expectations for when you're making a detachment around a theme has to hit the expectation of the fantasy that the player has. And then from a more technical standpoint, rather than ruining the fantasy of the player, Annihilation Legion, <laughs> the crack that was smoked the day they wrote that and why I was very upset with the codex. I'm aware that currently Necrons are quite strong in competitive play. It does not make the codex well written. Right. That is true. The Annihilation Legion in particular is the biggest whiff. It is a destroyer cult faction with flayed ones because they don't really belong anywhere else. That is a good use of my previous throw something in with harvesters to get their numbers up. Yeah, actually they kind of work well enough together. I can see it. Sure. Yeah, good thing on the other rule, but this is where it fails on this rule. For the destroyer cults, there are seven models. Three of them don't have melee profiles. A fourth one only kind of <laughs> does. It, it might kill a space marine on occasion. Yeah. This is a melee sub faction only that cares about charging with units with guns. To put this in space marine perspectives for you, your intercessor gets a charge bonus. He's holding a gun with two hands. Why does he care? This is my problem with this sub faction. It was clearly a, oh crap, people love the score pack destroyers. I need to make a destroyer sub faction. Oh, and I forgot flayed ones. I'll throw them all together and give it a bad charge bonus. Then I'll give it that stupid below half strength thing in addition because I love putting that in everywhere this edition. Stop that. I don't hate it. It's a non-rule though. You can put zero points of power weight there when we're deciding on how much we've put into a detachment. So yeah, this detachment has huge flaws with it. If you want to play a pure destroyer list, this doesn't affect half your army. It breaks the previous rule. Right. Annihilation Legion does a couple things well, and then it fails multiple other rules. Even though it looked like it solved them, because I can make 2,000 points of destroyers, but I should have put it out on a table and looked at that and gone, wait a second, half of these are holding guns. Maybe I shouldn't make this a charge bonus. Maybe there should be something about shooting being involved somewhere. What if I just make them better at wounding stuff because their whole thing is destroying things? Or give them some sort of lethal hits ability or something or whatever. Right, however we end up doing it. Do more damage, attack better, bigger numbers or something. Not, you want to charge with that gun, right? <laughs> Hurt yourself to do more. Make things get hazardous. I heard Tao loves charging. <laughs> So, as a additional extra rule here... <laughs> I love that you've added this into a rule and it's just because I was already on You're... my anger with this detachment. I could have done a whole episode about this detachment. <laughs> like, this is such a specific we're literally targeting this one. Okay, yeah. This detachment upsets me. <laughs> but continue. While we're here and talking about charge bonuses, do not do reroll the charge roll. This is not good for how the game works. To explain this, rerolling a charge is already the best use of CP possible in a melee faction. Nothing else else holds so much weight in this game as a failed charge. You are already going out of your way to make sure that you have easy charges that you cannot fail because you cannot rely on a percent chance of failing. You will lose the game. If you're a melee focused faction, you're banking on closing to melee. 100% of the damage you're going to do this game relies on you passing your charge roll first. So your entire strategy. We get into a whole argument that charge rolls in general need to be redone. The charge roll is quite possibly one of the biggest weaknesses with the design of 40 if we were doing a ground up heavy rework of the game where we really put our nose to the grindstone and throw everything out the window and redesign it, charge rules probably don't stay the way they are. I would agree. Every melee focused faction plays with the assumption that their charge rules are going to happen because it has to. You can't design your strategy around, but what if I fail? Because then you've done nothing. You're not an army anymore. <laughs> so with that aside, we want to be rerolling our charge roll. The first one that we reroll is our most important because we're humans and we're not stupid, hopefully. 
So we're going to re-roll the most valuable one, because we can only do it once per phase naturally. We've probably set up as many as we can to not be failable to begin with. It is going to be very rare where I'm not holding a CP anyway for a natural re-roll, where I want to do re-rolls for my charges because they're going to be too long of a bomb and I'm concerned about it failing. At this point, it is almost always going to be better for the reliability of the charge to just give me plus one of my charge roll, because then it will stack with the already available natural re-roll I have access to from the core rules of the game. I don't need that as a rule on my detachment. Because like the re-rolling the charge roll is only realistically going to come up when you're trying to hit a long charge. Yeah, if we had three CP for the entire length of the game and that was it, then okay, this is now very required because melee factions would not work without this. In fact, I think at that point it would be immediately obvious that charge rolls have to change at a core level and we have to all get in the conference room right now. Yeah, it would either be very obvious or point numbers would be changed so drastically that it would be hidden kind of thing. Either way, not good. Whole different lecture. Anyway, that's my random spiel. Don't do charge rerolls. Do plus one because it will work in accent to something that I'm already relying on as a melee faction. It's fine to have charge rerolls on like a character ability or something like that, but this is your detachment rule. That needs to be way better than just rerolling charge rolls. All right, let's continue back to the core ideas and rules to detachments. All right, so next real lesson. When a detachment is too narrow in scope and you're looking to fix it, abuse the leader system to expand your scope. That is a very nice and clean way of the, like, oh, you don't have enough models to cover, you know, half of your 2K list or whatever. Take a look at leaders. So the clear winner from this was the questing tendrils rule for the Vanguard Invader Force. So in Tyranids, there's not that many Vanguard Invaders, but one of them is the Wing Tyranid Prime, who can then lead normal Tyranid Warriors, a very standard unit. And because he's got the keyword, he gives it to them. And now they are a Vanguard Invader unit and are therefore affected by the detachment rule. This is a way to make it so that your limited rule affects a much broader set of models. Now, this is basically the only example of this thus far, and I'm really not sure if they did it on purpose or if they went, ooh, that was pretty cool. I feel like like it was probably on purpose, but I can understand that like this is something that could be difficult to balance just because it's one of those like we have to then look at all the leader interactions. This is something you should be thinking of anyway. When you're using keywords to determine what can be affected by a detachment, you should already be keeping in mind if leaders can accidentally give their keyword to somebody they shouldn't. Yeah. So this is just a way to do it on purpose to make it better. And like honestly, that's something that your detachment rule needs to look at as well is if all of your leaders give an ability, your detachment rule probably doesn't need to also give that ability. Yeah, which it is another good point, honestly. Like, take a look at what is needed when you have an actual list. And it's why I was half thinking when I was mentioning the things you could give destroyers. I was like, actually, I bet if I were to check certain wound bonuses already on their data sheets or with their leaders, at which point I've got to think of something else to add. But that, again, is the whole, as we're writing this codex, we can put the synergies where they should be. Yeah. And it's also another example of like, yeah, it is actually difficult to write all of these rules. Like it's not just a, well, I sat down and uh, by lunch I had the codex written. No. Yeah. For people in the audience, when we're doing this hour plus long bitch fest, it is always easier to be a critic than to be the one creating something. We are brutally aware. I do not feel any real animosity towards the people who wrote these rules as much as I need to vent about them. This shit is hard. And we talk about, okay, you want to change what your detachment rule is doing with leaders. It's giving a different ability. Well, that means that we have to then look at all of the leaders and what they lead, what they give. Should we change those? If we change those, what does that do to the other detachment rules? Everything affects everything else. And it should. There should be all of those synergies. It's difficult to do, but it can be done better in a lot of cases. So that basically covers the detachment rule. But there is more to detachments. Technically. They have enhancements. And they have stratagems, which is the only way you get stratagems outside of the core stratagems in 10th edition. The stratagems are important. They are, but they should be considered after designing the rule and finding your fantasy that you want this to fulfill. Get together some example lists and look at what do you want to give them as tools in their toolbox. Some of those tools should be, oh, this is a pretty general thing that you kind of need to shore up a bit just because you're doing a swarm kind of style sub faction that doesn't have 
good anti-tank. Let's give you a some type of stratagem that gives you something to deal with it a little bit. Yeah, a way to shore up weak points. I actually appreciate the anti-blast stratagem where you have to spend your CP to get around your blast. It's not the custodies problem where your detachment rule just solves all your issues. It is a one of my units can get out of jail free once per turn at the cost of my precious resource. Right, and that is great. That's a good use of stratagems. Especially when they're able to link up together with the detachment rules and the themes that that detachment's trying to do. I would say, please, avoid stratagems that only work on one unit. Even in our stupid model selling detachment, the monolith stratagems are a little cringe, bro. Don't do that. I don't hate having one of them. Like, if you're obviously designing a detachment around a model, and like you've followed all the rest of the rules, and like the rest of the army is able to take advantage of some stuff, having one of your stratagems be tied to that model is okay. You have five others though, and they better be pretty ubiquitous for everything else. And speaking of that from the stratagem standpoint, getting into enhancements. We have very few of these. We can't really run that many. I'm still salty. I will continue to be salty about this until the edition ends and is hopefully fixed. However, in our current edition, please make sure when you are filling out the enhancements, this has mostly had a good job done to it, that your enhancements fit your identity and fill holes that may arise in the type of list that you want people building in this faction. If you've got a monster mash attachment, make sure that all of your enhancements work with monsters or things that should be supporting monsters. You did a good job with this, I checked. Don't waste a slot on some five point pistol that makes some guy who has two shots in a turn do slightly more damage where it's never going to statistically change the outcome of a game. These are not good enhancements to be putting into these detachments. Those kinds of things were fine when we had so many options. Even then, I still think they were not really fine. They were a bloat that wasn't needed. But given that we only have four... (laughs) There is no room for this can be attached to an ad mech character who at most has a pistol and it makes their pistol have dev wounds. When it's the meme squirt gun, it's a little funny, but even that is very narrow for one of your four enhancements. Yeah, I think it's easier to accept that the enhancements could be a little weak, but optimally all four of them should be good and do the things that the sub faction wants to do. That detachment should want to pick those enhancements. And for our final enhancement point here, if you're like Admech and have some enhancements that are called by a single called out character model, the Skatari Marshal, you should really be questioning if this should not just be part of the Skatari Marshal's data sheet. Yeah. If you're making an enhancement to enhance a single character data sheet, something is probably wrong. Avoid it if you can. I feel like RX Champions for Custodes does that, but there's two. Technically more because of the shield cap and he gets their special thing. Things, but it's blade champion and shield captain. Yeah, so that's again, it's a narrow range, but at the same time, it's not a big army to begin with. No, that like that one actually kind of makes a little bit of sense. It still has two options, maybe a little bit more because like I don't know. To me, like shield captain and shield captain and terminator armor, are, like same fucking thing. So. Okay, while well, we're on the subject, let's do null maiden vigil. This is the sisters of silence detachment that is coming out for custodies. One of their four detachments they have access to. This is a failure as we have covered at the top. I am happy this is here. It is a prong of custodies and deserves to have its own detachment. They should have had more detachments, but one of them should at least be for sisters. Sisters is an insanely small range. So small, in fact, it is made up of paint a rhino gold and there is one kit that covers the character and all three units that can be built out of the kit. So technically, every one of these enhancements covers a single character. For the knight centura. But it is the entire range. Yeah. I think the real issue here is it's a further proof that Sisters of Silence need like biker sisters or jetpack sisters, something else so that there's a little variety in here and then you make a character of that variety so you've got at least two and then the named one who will never get an enhancement and then we're talking now. So on that I would prefer to have a detachment that doesn't quite hit all of our rules if the alternative is we just don't get a detachment because there aren't enough models in the range. Agreed. But please make a note of that and go to sales and be like, people enjoyed this detachment, make more of them. Uh, It all comes back to the (laughs) shitty salesman. (laughs) 
<laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it's one of those, like out of all these rules, if you can't hit them because there are not enough models, I'm still okay with having the detachment exist. But fire off a memo saying like, hey, we have a clear hole in this range that should be filled when we've got the spare development time and the hundred grand to spend on a new mold. And you know, it's one of those that like this can be, you know, the extra detachment. If that's the case, then uh, you really need to expand the range or I guess just kill it like uh, Harlequins, but please unkill Harlequins. I really do like them better than Eldari. <laughs> Same. Or just turn Eldari all into Harlequins. True Uno reverse card. Got him. So that is the end of our lecture. However, I think we should go through the codices that have come out and give a quick rundown for how we feel they've done on each one. Starting off, Space Marines. You hit above the number. Congratulations. There are enough detachments. I'm really not a fan of First Company, but that's a whole different topic. It's fine. It hits enough of the rules. Right. And everything else is basically covering a major theme of the army by being all the chapters. Technically, you could say the one that is Ultramarines, Gladius, is just also the general identity of Marines being the all-adaptable guys. I guess I don't know enough about the lore, like, that's Ultramarines? Generally, it's Marines, but Ultramarines are the most ultra of the Marines. Somewhere out there, someone is dying. <laughs> But the point is, Space Marines, pretty good job. I'm not giving you letter grades or anything today. Maybe later. That would be a fun episode late in the edition. We'll see. Tyranids? Tyranids, you hit your six. Congratulations. There should have been a seventh at least because we don't even have a shooty detachment. Mostly follow the rules. There are some exceptions that I brought up throughout this. It wasn't perfect, but it's a fine attempt. I feel like the big problem with Tyranids is you just need more. You have a large range. You have decent separate ideas that can be fleshed out further. Expand on them. Have more detachments. Necrons and Admech, we start running into issues. Necrons failed to meet the basic six, and one of them was Annihilation Legion. And another one was a single model sales one, which is the Monolith Faction. Yeah. Real dicey. This is a, this is a low score. It's another one that, like, a couple of them are good, but, like, yeah, the Annihilation Legion, even ignoring your issues with it that I feel are a bit strong. It, it's just worse than playing the generic index of detachment. It is just worse, yes. And, uh, yeah, honestly, they just missed having enough of the primary major themes. I get more annoyed on the fact that, like, Necrons had more. They took away, did a bad job with some of the ones they replaced stuff with, and didn't even get up to my basic line of six, which is not a high bar. No, it's Actually, because like Necrons have interesting things going on. Like there are enough unique themes that like it really isn't that difficult to fill out. Admech is the biggest pain in my side because as much as I want to complain about Necrons, I'm not allowed to because you exist. Wow. You're so pitiable that I can't even complain about the problems with Necrons, which are admittedly somewhat fine other than they needed more detachments. Yeah. Necrons needed more and a bunch of the problems would have been like, eh, Okay, fine. Admech is through and through. What the f- fuck was going on it breaks every detachment breaks at least two to three rules in the list maybe more yeah there's a couple that i'm just like this was not the castellan robot one it breaks my brain so much the idea they realized that they didn't give army rules to half of the units in the army and tried to make a detachment that gives you the other half of your army rules that should have just been in the damn army <laughs> should have been part of it and then and that's like all it does and it's like oh my god you were so close to realizing what you fought up. Yeah, and you had the right idea. People love it. Let's make a detachment about it. Cool. I, yeah, I, Admac did not do well. There are problems in every one of them. So anyway, Dark Angel Supplement, who cares? It was three extra detachments for Space Marines and they give you more flavors. Space Marines is going to have 22 of these things at this point, and that's if there's not other ones that'll get sprinkled in through White Dwarf and everything. So, whatever. I don't really have strong opinions on the Dark Angels one. I'm aware that Dark Angels players are mad about other problems that are not how their detachments work or anything. The detachments, honestly, I think are pretty reasonable. It's not a full codex anyway. It is a supplement to a Space Marine army yes. to give you more options. I'm not overly concerned. Tau is the first of the really rough bunch. Unless there's a hidden detachment that I haven't seen, Tau is four detachments and is nine pages long. I'm really hoping that there is a quantum pair of pages in here to get it above that line. Yeah. No matter how much I flip them, they don't exist. There's also some problems in the 
any individual detachments. The crew detachment, which would be fine if there was enough detachments, but that one, again, it's going to feel sour. Just like with Custodes, people being sour about the sister's detachment, which should exist. But there are so few detachments that it feels bad to people who don't care about that part of the army. It's similar to Necrons, where if you had more detachments, a lot of the problems would be kind of go away just because it would be like well you only want to play that when you want to don't worry about it it's just an extra but like we've got six other options don't worry about it but you don't you have four (laughs) like come on man so tau doesn't even have like a tank heavy one as much as i know i'm the tank hater that is weird for tau actually again the problem is like mecha or a tank mecha or a tank Right. When it's guard and it's tank or idiots in flak vests, I, I'm taking the tank. <laughs> Throwing rocks at the uh, tanks. I'm going to choose the tank. I get it. But but there should still have been a tank detachment. There should have been. Because like, there are people who enjoy the tanks. It's definitely a unique aesthetic that the other tanks don't really have. So Tau also has a shitload of named characters they have access to. It would have been nice to do something like Arc Champions where you really play into... There was a fun way to play Tau in ninth where you played named character spam. That would have been a cute extra one to throw in there. There's quite a few that I know Tau players have talked ad nauseum about things that were not in this codex. And I'm aware competitive players are going to bitch because Tau looks like it may be very busted and people are going to be very sick of playing against a singular list of it at some point. But that's not what this is about. Yeah, kind of a failure. At least they have a few of the fundamentals, I guess. But uh, is it orcs or custodies? Let's add none on the high notes. Let's do custodies. Custodies is possibly the low point of all of this. Four detachments. And we already talked about Null Maiden. Like, it's detachment that should exist that's great and i'm glad it does but they're pretty rough too like you don't have a biker detachment yeah what the fuck bike spam is like something that people love doing in custodies where's the biker detachment you put this out at the exact same time as orcs you could have looked slightly to your left and cheated on this exam and passed <laughs> Cheating off of orcs. Brilliant. Please, if cheating off of orcs would have made you successful and you failed. I mean, to be fair, orcs has done pretty fantastic generally in all of our grading. True. Orcs is a very well-rounded large faction with a lot of aspects, a lot of lore. It's an easy A. But custodies, come on. It is wild that you have so few. It also bothered me of like, I'm aware they're forge rolled, and this was probably a political play internally, but why was there not a vehicle and dread detachment? I don't want to get into like, do we start speculating? Uh, yeah, 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 rumors abound, but... Let's not do that, but there's so many obvious holes, and it's not even like Custodes is that big of a range, but like they have some pretty unique characteristics that you're missing in the detachments. Come on, guys. It's extremely frustrating for how easy this could have been improved. Yeah. I'm not even talking from the, I'm aware a lot of Custodes players are overly down on it because they lost their broken index detachment, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about like... Just just not filling out a codex. It's nine pages long. I am actually like, I think they were correct in getting rid of the index one because that would have been balance problems for the rest of the detachments. Not my problem with it. And I love the way it was reimagined in the mixed arms one of having sisters give the aura to custodies. Now there's a weak point that you can target and play and have an interactive game with your opponent. Yeah. What a novel concept. Synergies within an army and interactive gameplay between two players. Wow. I honestly, Talons of the Emperor is a standing ovation in a pile of garbage. Yeah. So let's end on the high point. Orcs, let's go. So the final of the orc detachments leaked today. Everything is here. Everyone is here. Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. They didn't screw up. There is a couple things that, yes, people would love. One for more free Buddha focus. Yeah, we don't have Badrock anymore as a character, blah, blah, blah. So let's be honest. We could have 20 orc detachments and orc players would be like yeah but like what about this other thing that'd be cool wouldn't it and be like yeah that would be cool let's have 21 so like (laughs) it's like space Marines in that way you would always find more to add and i don't have a problem with them adding on in the future but what they have covers so much correctly there are so many well-made fantasies in here things that are going to be oh my god we get to play nothing but the 45 year old boy models that i have (laughs) Green Tide, let's go. That one is almost assuredly getting FAQ'd at some point based off the math that I was doing with some people. Of, uh, we'll see. It's fucking broken. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking more about the 
uh, 140 or whatever grots that you can field. Hey, that one's, again, I love shit like that. The fact that that's there. It's great. The little things are fantastic. And there are small problems for a bunch of these that it'd be like, yeah, we could tweak a few things, but like you hit the rules that we've put together. Like you've done the job and it's, it's going to be fun. Balance aside, I don't care for right now. That's for data slates. The groundwork is laid for a very fun addition for orc players. I'm so, so happy. <laughs> the fact that I could easily riddle off like three or four more detachment types I'd love to see for orcs is a whole different thing of like, you could have gone further still. You met the minimum. We could have had more. Could have done a psychic wa energy type thing. Could have done something a little more shooty based because they're really, shooter boys are, are not good in any detachment still. They are a whole just falling through the floor. You basically like tank bus does. Yeah, and you can run shooty, shooty lists in like Dread Mob and Cult of Speed has the option. They exist, but a shoot a boy army is not going to do well. But like, those are still fun enough with like some of these that you can toss them in the list and it'll be like, yeah, okay. But that's okay if there's more detachment ideas when you already have like a solid core options that you want to want to play basically. And that's the thing. It's like all of these, I'm like, yeah, man, I kind of want to play that. <laughs> At least once or twice. Yeah. Some of them might not be your specific cup of tea, but you're at least like cool i'll play that once i've got a cool idea for next saturday yeah so it is nice like you said to end on a high note they can make good codexes <laughs> There's a lot of rules that some of the codexes don't follow, and I feel like there's going to be codexes in the future that are going to be more like custodies than orcs. And this gets into the problem of, like, even if everyone gave them feedback that matched this, right? Like, let's say this is very popular and everyone agrees, which I highly doubt. There's always a YouTube comments section. And it's one of those that, like, we're fucking spitballing ideas here kind of thing. Like, we haven't actually put together, like, oh, here's a detachment that you should make kind of thing. But at the same time, even if everybody agreed, the flaw of printed rules still shines through like a beam of crap. A solid laser-like beam of Ruining shit. all plans. Because we already <laughs> saw, before AOS's announcement, there was the leak where there was the picture from, like, the Chinese print shop with, like, the palette full of stuff, right? And there was very clearly pages for lore pages for a codex for Grey Knights. They were sprawled out with a bunch of other stuff in the print area. That's just how logistics works, man. Especially for a hardcover book, you're looking months to years in advance. It's at least six months. Look at the current schedule. Where's Grey Knights on the current schedule? They don't exist yet. They haven't even told us what's coming this fall yet. Grey Knights is probably in there. Or if Grey Knights doesn't come out until winter, you can now know how very long the turnaround was. It wouldn't be shocking for it to be winter. Yeah. And if that's already the printer, everything before then has much less feedback than whatever you've given up through today. Yeah. And that was basically based on like Tyranid, maybe. Yeah. Like Space Marines and Tyranids would have come out when they were still finalizing what to do with that codex that just went to print. A lot of the ones we've seen were probably finalized before the edition started. That's why Custodes doesn't have the updated Dev Wounds stuff, because Dev Wounds hadn't changed by the time this went to print months and months and months ago. Yeah. Which is why everything's gonna have to get FAQ'd in the Custodes book, which is a whole, printed books are not how rules should work. I can't believe I'm saying this in the year of our Lord 2024. Yeah. But what would you have them do, Brad? Give out free rules on, like, a phone app? And have a wildly successful book series still of art books and lore books. It's not like you already are doing that. That doesn't sound reasonable at all. You could just do more of that to a high quality standard and everyone would eat it up like crazy. Especially if they're all high on the fact that you just gave them free rules and they love you and want to throw money at you right now. <sighs> But anyways. But this is the company that just did the worst possible implementation of squatting armies and just threw out a random no notes <laughs> article. <laughs> That doesn't even remind you that half the stuff they're squatting is being replaced. We already have the leaks telling us as much. You could have just said it in the article and gone, look, new equivalent, uh, whatever. Warhammer Weekly did a fantastic rant on this. Go watch that. Same company that did that is doing this stuff. So learning is not their strong suit. Maybe one day, though. We'll just have to keep releasing videos like this. <laughs> Surely they'll listen eventually. <laughs> <laughs> this is how my wife controls me. If you just yell the same thing at him long enough, eventually through osmosis, he'll learn. 
I was like, it won't even happen consciously. It'll just be part of the subconscious that just does the thing. All right. Well, that does it for this topic. Thank you for staying around for this long. I know it was a long negative episode, but I hope there was enough actual critical thought in this that people were still entertained throughout and nodding along. I don't like doing these that often, so something much happier will be coming down the road next week, I'm sure. And then the week after. Ooh, there's something the week after that, you think? What could it be? Uh, Maybe it's something about reading about Katia falling. Katia falling can only be a good thing. (laughs) There might be a few of those remarks during the episode. (laughs) Yeah, book club, week of the 29th. I'm partway through the book. I'm basically restarting the book for reasons. Yeah, we'll get into that on the episode. I'm actually excited to do this review because it's not just a glowing positive the whole way through thing. This is a very fun book to be talking about. Don't forget, take a look at our merch. Orchid8.com, Poor Hammer. We've got shirts. We've got hoodies. There's We've also got snot sweats, all over the place. But not on your hoodies. <laughs> that you have to pay extra for. All right, but thank you for sticking with us, everybody. Before we go, quick apology for the fact that we are entering spring and we are both allergic to Michigan. So I probably sound awful and it will only get worse for the next while. Blame Borelio for not editing better. Yeah, why didn't you fix my voice in post? (laughs) Careful, little man. I'm a god in here. I can stop time. I can make you say what I want. Jam the cheese dick in there. And I can also call your wife bread. Just kidding, that would be too much work. That's where I draw the line. So back to the episode, I guess. But we do have some shout outs that we have to do for the month, though. Yes, we do. Starting with 4K fart. <laughs> what a start. That's a strong start. <laughs> 99 Nines. Adrian Franke. Alex Fuja. All Nighter. Andreas. Bedlam's Nemesis. Beth Jezos. Cameron R. Chroma Vale. Craig Judge. Dominic Colosico. Dragon Egg. Edward Lawrence. Ellis Corton. Ethan Gerard. Finn Smiley's. Grundle Bundle. Gun Game 4453. Gyarados. Hyperion TV. Iron. Iron Father. Jacob Gibson. Jared DiPerno. Jaden. Jeff Stumpo. Joel. Kalex. Kiwi Fruit Bird. Lucas. Matthew Tsushima. Michael Melcher. Monkey 218. Morfield 55. Nikki. NJ Harlan. I'll be Bark. Proteus 7331. Quinchester. Riley Goddard. Robert Serma. Rookie XP. Samuel Summerfield. Scott Gray. Severed Sage. Squareson. The Marine Who Plays Tau. The Crusader 13. The Ulamog. Ulamog. The Ulamog. Eric, it's a magic card. It hasn't been that long since we've recorded a magic episode. Exactly. Fucking, I, it's a magic card. We don't know how to read those. Well, that's true. <laughs> Tobias. Tyler Luke. Vault Guardian, Weebay, and Yasser Zazo. Thank you all so much for supporting the show. And we also have producers. They are Brandon Janke, Demolition Man, Dr. Lace, Yon Guy C, Joel Rachels, Michael DeLulo, and Rock. Thank you so much. All right, but that's it. Play the music and let's get out of here. Sounds good. Sounds good.